Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing well, as always, staying happy and healthy and hydrated and all that good stuff. And in this video, I have a lot more uh, crazy encounters with things that just can't be explained, really. And there's also the weird, like, reality glitch or altered reality story. So, definitely, if that sounds like something that you like, pull up a stump with me. And let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. And thank you for 15,000 subscribers. It's been a hell of a time, hasn't it? So I lived in a small town on Vancouver Island for my entire childhood. And I sure did see some weird stuff. So a few years back, when I was, I would say, younger, I was camping with my dad and my brother. Our campsite was near this large river, I don't remember the name of it. The river had very strong currents. It was strong enough to pull away a full-grown man if you were unfortunate enough to get caught out there. So one night, I go out to pee, and I bring my trusty flashlight. I'm peeing in the bushes on the beach by the river, and I hear this ungodly screech from the other side of the river. All the hair in my body stands on end. I shot my flashlight across the river and start scanning the beach. I see the reflections of six sets of eyes in the bushes. I see one set of them moving toward the river. It looked like if a wolf and a gorilla had a child. I start backing away. I felt safer because of the river. But then this thing just started wading through the water toward me. I start running back to my campsite, and I hear the screaming from these things behind me. I wake up my brother and my dad. I told them what was happening. We leave everything and get into the truck. We see these things, three of them, running towards our truck. We floor it and drive away. We come back the next day to get our stuff. Our tent is wrecked, and everything is strewn about, but nothing was taken. Now I know what a Sasquatch is supposed to look like, but I think this thing was different. It looked like what some people might call a dog man. This is only the first story I've been witnessing strange things in the forest. So this isn't dog man related, but it happened when I was a teenager. I was sneaking out for the first time and I was at this park with a girl and her friends. It's around midnight. The park is connected to the forest, and we're playing truth or dare, as all teenagers do. I get dared to run naked through the woods. I think I'll seem cool, so I do it. I'm running for like a minute down a path. It's unusually windy. I'm getting kind of scared because I keep hearing what sounds like grunting or some kind of weird noise just in the tree line. I turn around because I'm getting really freaked out. Ahead of me on the path, I see someone walk out from the trees. It's an old guy. He appears to be native. He starts screaming at me to come over to him. I try hiding in the bushes. As I'm hiding, he grabbed onto my wrist. I see that his eyes are a milky white, like he's blind. He starts trying to talk to me, or communicate me in his native language. He seems terrified as well. He lets go and starts pointing toward the park. So I get the idea, so I run back and put my clothes on. I walk out to see my friends hiding underneath a picnic table. Apparently, a very large bird, almost the size of a dog, flew into the playground, and I started screeching at them while I was gone. Fast forward a year later, we're doing a class about First Nations people, and I'm doing some research for a project, and then I find an old story about a blind old man who can control animals. He would stop evil creatures from coming into the villages so he would also scare children away from going into the woods at night. So that just makes me think 
that there was something out there in those woods with me that night. So I've told this story to quite a few people before, but here it is even still. Me and six friends hiked to Mount Eleanor, and once we reached the summit as a group, we hung out for a bit, and we were talking to some random strangers up there, just about how the hike was and the view and all that type of stuff. I'm a bit afraid of heights, so the experience is somewhat uncomfortable for me, and I got tired of it and bored of it quickly. It's extremely beautiful, but it makes my hands shake, and I start sweating every time I look down. One of my friends, who is also not fond of heights, and decides that he's done with this too, decides that we should head down together while the rest of the group is going to follow down later on. We took two vehicles, so it worked out like that. So we're heading down, and we get to an area just past the fog. We somehow head down an area, and we end up off the path about a hundred feet or so. It was really weird, and we got really turned around. This area of the mountain has large dirt hills with areas of heavy tree cover off to one side. Once we realize that we're off the trail, we start to try to find our way back. And then we start to get to some familiar looking territory, so we realize that we're pretty close to the trail. But then we hear a woman's voice yelling, Help me! It sounds like it's coming from the heavily forested area off to the right. We consider trying to find the source, but before we can decide what to do, the sound kind of morphs, and you can't really tell what it is anymore. We both get a pretty sinister feeling from this, so we just continue down the trail. Then the voice starts following us, but we could never see the source, or even really point out its direction. We get to an area of the path that is all pretty large boulders that you have to jump across. The voice or sound has evolved into an almost ape-like squawk, I guess, and we're moving as quickly as possible. At some point, my friend pulls out his hunting knife, which is a pretty dumb thing to do when you're running down boulders, but I guess he was just as nervous as I was, and we had made pretty good distance while being followed by whatever this was. As soon as we got to the end of the boulder field, the sound stopped, and everything returned to normal. We went down into the switchbacks and the trees, and we crossed paths with some other hikers. We warned them that there was something weird up the trail, but they didn't seem too phased by it. After that, we got to the bottom and waited for the rest, and they didn't mention anything weird happening. So, I don't know what happened to us, or what we heard. I just got back from spending time with my relatives for my grandfather's birthday, and he retold an old story. This reminded me of a few other stories that other relatives have told me, but I'll start with this. So my grandfather was visiting his sons, my uncle's, land. It was a family trip, wanting to do some hunting and fishing, typical Missouri pastimes. They've been deep in the woods all day. It's now late, and it's getting dark. They haven't found any deer today, so, you know, they were kind of moping about that, feeling kind of defeated, so they decided to head home. So my grandfather leaves his stand, and the uncle, his other son, my dad, and my dad's other brother are on the other side of the property. While walking through the woods back to the uncle's cabin, it's pretty dark, and he meets up with his uncle on the way. They see this glow up ahead, and they think, oh, that's really weird. And my grandfather points it out to my uncle, and they both definitely see it. They decide to approach, because my uncle wants to make sure that there's nobody on his land that isn't supposed to be there. They're not scared, they're armed with hunting rifles, and I think they also have 38s, 
I'm not a gun person, so I don't know. They reach the source of the glow. It's not a flashlight, or a fire, or a glow stick. It's just a soccer ball sized gooey mass. They decide to do the American thing, in my grandfather's exact words, and blast the shit out of it. My grandpa and my uncle's bullets just get sucked into the ball. There's no bullet hole, no damage, nothing. The bullets just get sucked into the goo and stay there. So they think, well that's super weird, and the thing doesn't retaliate at all. It just continues just floating there. So they decide to just leave it and go back to the cabin and don't look back. I've heard this story a few times from my grandfather and my uncle, each separate, and they always have the exact same details. This consistency is particularly impressive in my mind for my grandfather, who is getting well on in years, and you'd expect the details to start getting muddy, but they're crystal clear every time. My uncle's land, if you could ever see it, definitely looks like the place for spooky stuff to happen. The land is massive and mostly wilderness, other than a couple of houses that are now mostly abandoned and falling apart that some workers used to live in when he had them doing stuff on the property. The entire place is covered in small lakes and ponds and a good number of caves. Most of the caves are now all roped off, or he lets geology students use them for whatever rock people do with rocks. My second story is from my dad and my grandma, and took place in super northern Minnesota, right on the border with Canada. So they were on a family trip in the north for a week in the summer. They were staying at this cabin resort that was on a large lake. There's lots of cabins lining one side of the lake, and the other sides are covered mostly in forest and hiking trails that lead to other lakes. A few of the cabins on the farthest side of the row were disused, falling apart, and being retaken by the forest. So they were night fishing in a small boat with Grandma because, you know, being from Missouri, a Missouri vacation basically means fishing somewhere else. So it was clear skies and a bright moon, very good vision. They decide to work the bank by the disused cabins. They take a boat closer to the shore. They look up at an old cabin about a hundred yards from the shore, and they can see a large, dark figure standing right by the cabin. The moon is bright, so they can see it. The figure is covered in thick hair. Dad looks back at Grandma. She's staring at the figure, too. The boat is still approaching the shore. The thing by the cabin either hears the engine approaching or just decides to leave. It turns around and lumbers off into the woods. My dad and my grandma decide to take the boat to the other side of the lake because they pay good money to be there. They keep fishing and they don't see a whole lot at the resort again. And I first heard that story because for a while it was sort of a tradition every few years with the extended family. I would drive a boat with my brothers and my grandma when she pointed out the cabin and told me. My dad told it to me again when I was fishing with him and he pointed out the exact cabin as we drove past it. The building was basically overgrown at this point, but there was still some structure there. Overall, I think the whole lake was much more developed than when dad and grandma had their sighting so I doubt whatever it was is still sticking around. A friend of my dad's would babysit me sometimes when I was little. My mom wasn't exactly in the picture, and he used to tell me a story that still scares the absolute shit out of me, even to this day. My dad's friend, I'll call him Bob for the purpose of this, He's driving a rig out in the middle of pretty much absolute nowhere in Oregon. He has to make the delivery by the following morning, so he decides to just drive through the night. It's like 1am, there's no one else out on the roads. He hasn't seen another car in probably a hundred miles. He's 
literally in the middle of nowhere. Suddenly, the whole entire sky lights up. It's instantly like daylight. Bob slams on the brakes and has no idea what the hell's going on. Everything stays lit for a good solid ten seconds. He can see everything. Whatever's happening, it's not lightning. It doesn't stop or flicker. It just stays bright. He hunkers down, anticipating that maybe the U.S. got bombed or something and there was nuclear devastation that was imminent. But suddenly, it's over. The sky goes dark. There's no sound. There's no blast wave. He sits there in the middle of the road, waiting for almost five minutes, then decides to keep going. He figures it was maybe a meteor or something, and kinda laughs to himself about getting so worked up over it. But two miles up the road, he sees a car with its flashers on, stopped in the middle of the road. He stops a good distance away from it. There's not enough room to go around it. The front end of the car is crumpled, like it hit something. Bob figures that they probably hit a deer that got spooked whenever the meteor or whatever went over and it ran out into the road. He gets out of the cab and goes to see if the driver is okay. The driver's sitting on the ground by the driver's side door. He has his knees up and is resting his head on his arms. Bob calls, hey buddy, you okay? He then stops about 10 feet away for seemingly no reason. Something about the situation feels weird. Bob is one of those guys that always listens to his gut, so he stays put. God, my head is killing me, the guy says. But he doesn't lift his head up, so it's muffled. Bob asks, did you hit a deer or something? He's getting more uneasy. Something feels wrong. But he still can't figure out just what it is. The guy says he thinks he may have hit his head. He asks Bob to please help him. Bob takes a step forward, but his instincts are going apeshit. He looks at everything again, and that's when he notices it. The car is all wrong. It looks like what someone who had never seen a car might think a car looks like. It has all the right pieces, but there's nothing extra, if that makes sense. Bob says it looks like a cheap Hot Wheels knockoff, and looked all wonky and wrong. He looks around back at the car and realizes that not only is there no license plate, there's not even a trunk. It's just a solid piece of material with taillights put in it. There's no manufacturer or model names. Bob knows cars, and this is nothing that he's ever seen before. From where he's standing, he can see there's no tailpipe or even hubcaps. It's just the shape of a car. He starts back up, and the guy asks him for help again. Bob tells him that he can't help him, and that he'll call a tow truck when he gets to the next town. The guy lifts his head and looks at Bob. He tells him again that he hit his head. But something is really wrong with the guy's face. But again, it took Bob a second to figure it out. This is how he described it. Everything on the man's face was where it should have been, in their normal positions. He looked normal, except for the fact that his eyes and mouth were upside down. Bob goes apeshit and runs back to his rig. Just as he climbs in and closes the door, and locks it. The man slams into the door behind him and is at his window. He thinks, how the hell did he get here so fast? He knocks on the glass and smiles at Bob through the window, but because his mouth is upside down, it looks like he's screaming. He tells Bob to open the door and let me in. Bob floors it. He doesn't care if he hits the guy or not. His truck easily pushes the car out of the way. Whatever it was, it was light, and it made no sound. It was like it was weightless when he hit it. So, he got away, but he still has no explanation for just what he encountered that night.
This is really hard for me to explain, but I swear to God it happened. I'll try to make sense of it. I was 17. I set my alarm for 6.15 for school the next day. I go to bed at my usual time. I slept fine. I didn't have any weird dreams or anything. The next morning, my alarm goes off. Right away, something feels different, wrong. It feels too early. I check my phone and my physical alarm clock. They both say 6.15. It's not daylight savings time, so it shouldn't feel this early. I get up. I start getting dressed, but I can't shake that feeling that something is wrong. Something's not right. I decide to look out the window. This is where it gets really hard to describe, so bear with me. The sun was above the trees, but the sky was dark. It wasn't the moon. It was definitely the sun, but it was like the light wasn't hitting the ground. I could feel the warmth on my face, but there was no bright light to go with it. The trees and surrounding area were totally dark, like it was night. It was like I was wearing a really screwed up sunglasses or something. Anyway, I see all of this and of course I think that I'm losing my mind. I get on my computer and I check my local news. There's nothing about the weird day dark situation. So I run downstairs to go find my parents. They're both downstairs in the kitchen, looking out the back door to the porch and up into the sky. They hear me and turn around. Mom is crying and dad looks pale. I ask if they can see it. They say they do. I go over to them and look out at the bizarre situation. Suddenly, there's this absolutely deafening boom noise. It sounds like it comes from right over the house. Everything in the house shakes. A couple of windows even break. We fall to the floor. Mom is screaming and Dad is shouting to cover my ears and eyes. The noise goes on for a good 30 seconds. Just then it stops. It doesn't fade out or anything, it just ceases. We all get back up and look outside expecting to see some kind of total devastation. But nothing. The sky is back to normal. It's a bright sunny day. We all just sit there and look at each other like we're all trying not to go insane. I get chills all over me just thinking about it. I asked everyone at school, but no one had heard about it or saw anything weird. To them, it was just a regular day. So I ask our neighbors, but it's the same thing. Except the dude west of us, Mr. Booth. He says that he was going out to get the paper when he heard this kind of far-off screaming coming from our direction. He couldn't see us or anything, but he could hear the screaming. Suddenly, three of our windows just explode for no reason. And suddenly, we're there. He says that he just turned right around and went back into his house, not wanting anything to do with it. So I don't know what the hell happened. So this is the only inner woods experience that I've really ever had. I moved to Ohio the other summer just to live at this community art house. It was pretty cool in its heyday, but the rooms hardly get rented now. I'm personal friends with the owners, so I was offered permanent residency, provided that I help maintain the property. Thus, the move. This house was huge. It was an old Victorian-style home that they converted into their charity house. The house itself was four stories, with a huge wraparound porch that was built on top of one of the highest peaks in the town, the Ohio Valley. Now this house, although greatly remodeled from its original condition, still needed a lot of renovations. The only way to enter was through the back door, through the garden, up a flight of stairs that would take you to the second story of the house. 
When you entered through the second story, you would come into this narrow, dark hallway that had painted maroon ceilings. This floor had the kitchen and four other rooms that were turned into sewing rooms, print rooms, and other workshops slash workspace rooms. By the kitchen, there was a large foyer and a stairway that brought you down into the first floor. The first floor was converted into gallery rooms. There was also access to the front porch, but we hardly went out there because it was pretty unstable. Half of the first floor was converted into a personal apartment that they were hoping to rent out. This floor also had access to the basement, where they had a dark room and other photograph-related rooms, some screen printing machines and acid baths and that kind of stuff. Literally, there was this old clawfoot tub full of this acid just out in the open. The old bathroom walls were torn down, so the toilet was exposed too. Nobody used it, but it still looked used, if you can get what I mean. The basement has outdoor access, but no lock, and my friend's mom even warned me to barricade it at night to prevent intruders. On the second floor, right beside the stairwell, was a closet-looking door that led up to the attic. And behind this narrow door was a beautiful wooden stairwell that wrapped upwards to a hall with five bedrooms. When I was moving in, two of the bedrooms had been rented out. I was offered the apartment on the first floor, but it was kind of creepy down there, so I moved into the room in the attic. So, one guy is a 23-year-old poet. He seemed pretty cool. We hit it off pretty well. All of his favorite poems were about vaginas, which I thought was pretty cliche and naive, but whatever, you know. People like what they like. The other was a 19-year-old girl. She was pretty quiet, but would join in on the occasional drink of wine. And with the poet and myself, she seemed pretty polite and mature for her age. She was also a pretty conservative girl for her age. I thought she was cute anyways. The poet said he thought something was off about her. Anyways, right across the street from this house was the town cemetery. The cemetery had a zigzag road that went about two miles up the side of a mountain. I went for a hike to the top by myself one day to take a look at the valley. One side overlooked the town, but when you turned around, there was a large building and dense woods. I noticed a dirt trail in between a couple trees. At first, I thought it was private property because it looked close to the building, but I didn't see any signs against it. The path looked pretty well walked and just off grid. I walked towards the path, and then this bulldozer appeared from what I thought was a dead end or a driveway. I walked near a ledge to see that they were plowing new roads in the mountainside. The dozer just popped up from a hidden hill. The driver stops and looks over at me. Howdy. I was kind of shocked that he stopped to say hi. At first I thought I was in trouble for trespassing. I say, hello, I'm, I'm sorry, was I trespassing? Not that I'm aware of. I say, oh, well, the road looks great so far. Is it open to the public? I don't see any signs or ropes around. The driver looked at me, and he smirked at me as if he thought that I was trying to be a smartass. He said, so long as you don't get in our way, I suppose you're free to use the trails. But I recommend you coming back with a buddy, though. There are creatures out in these parts. And I think to myself... Why did you say creatures? I try to hold a longer conversation to find out more, but he just starts dozing away. As I'm watching him drive off, this old man on a lawnmower rides up beside me. I thought he tried to say hello, but he was hardly audible with the dozer so close to us. I just instinctively say, Howdy. He looks at me, smirks, and says, you're not from around here, are you? I say, what gave me away? He grinned a wide, toothless grin and said, well, your shoes and your hair look too nice to be working out in the sun. You must be from the city. I say, you got me there. I'm from Chicago, actually. He said, ah, a big city talker. 
so you don't know anything about these woods. Just be careful out there. We've got a lot of creatures out about, and you've got yours too, I'm sure. And I'm thinking, again with the creatures, what does this mean? I said, so I've heard. What kind of creatures are out this way? And he says, well, Sonny, I've been living around these parts for my entire life. And there are things that can explain and things that I can't explain. As far as you going on a hike goes, I just warned you to stick to the roads if you don't have a friend. And watch out for snakes and wolves. He rambles on for a bit, but I'm in no hurry, so I let the man speak for a bit longer when he mentions... I was also best friends with the man whose house you're staying in. He's buried here too. I like to think that I'm still around for him, looking out for him. This kind of creeped me out that he knew the house I came from, considering I didn't see him on my hike up, nor did I mention anything about where I was staying. He says, Anyways, I let you choose your path, young man. And he majestically mows down the mountainside. Ultimately, I decide not to take the trail right away, since there was plenty of daylight hours to burn. So I headed back down to the house to see if any other residents would be up for a hike. Because if I'm going to die in the woods, why be alone, right? I don't see the girl around, but I asked the poet if he would be up for it, because he seemed like the fit type anyways. He was reading a book and said that he wasn't in the mood, which... I understood that I was kind of expecting too much. And then I turn around to see the girl standing in the doorway to the attic. I'll go, she says. The poet puts down the book he was reading and looks up. She says, This house is too quiet for me. It'll be nice to get out. The poet jumps up. Yeah, what a great idea. Let's do it. We can pack the bags and get some rope and see how extreme we can get out in these woods. And I think, is he trying to come off like he proposed the idea? But whatever, I'm just happy to have people come along. I get some rope, gloves, snacks, and anything we might need to prepare for this venture. All the while, this poet guy is trying to hit on this clearly uninterested girl. It's about three o'clock when we head up to the cemetery road again. We reach the top at around four, and it appeared that the maintenance workers were gone for the evening. The girl notices the building as we get closer to it. Are you sure we can be here? Isn't this private property? I say I talked with a couple guys earlier. They said it was all cool. We get closer to the hidden path that I noticed from before. I say, here, this way. The poet looks at me like I'm crazy, and says, Dude, I don't think the lady wants to get tangled in shrubs. We should just take the road. The girl turned around, visibly angry, and said I can speak for myself, and I'm not afraid of any little dirt path. The poet grumbles as I'm indulging. We get to what I thought was the entrance to a long trail, but it was just a dirt clearing, maybe five feet long, between some trees. I say, that's weird, I thought the trail was longer. The poet guy says, face it, your trail's a dud. Let's go back to the real trail before we get ticks. The girl stands on the edge of the dirt path and points ahead. Do you guys see that? I walk over to her, and I notice that although the dirt trail ends, there is a significant clearing in the woods. Many trees have been taken down. I didn't really question it. I figured it's just Ohio industry. But there was a clear path, so we chose to follow it. The other guy is bitching most of the time. The girl is just quietly observing. I'm leading us when I stop to make a remark. Wait, before we get too far into this, we should mark some trees. That way we know how to get back out. I took out my knife and I marked an X on every few trees that we passed. All the ones I carved were sturdy growing trees. We maneuver around these woods for about half a mile when we start to see rooftops. As we got closer, we began to see the top of another town. As we get closer to the ledge, we notice a different, visibly walked path that was still hidden behind the trees, 
high up in the mountain, but standing from it, you could see the houses pretty well. I remember looking down for a moment and noticing that one of the closer homes had a light on. As I was staring, a naked woman passed by and closed the window and pulled her curtains. I got the most uncomfortable feeling ever. The girl speaks up. Wow, look at this view. I wonder if anybody knows about this path up here. The path looks continuous. The guy says, so are we going to stick with this one or are we heading him back up through the mountains through F all? No one else was creeped out, I guess, about this weird hidden trail. So I marked an X at the point that we found the path from the woods and we continued onward. It's about 530 and the sun is beginning to go down. We have had to follow this walked path for about an hour or so. When I cross my X again, I say, guys, look at this, and I point down. The poet guy rages. Are you kidding me? We've been walking around in a circle for more than an hour? Screw you, man. This adventure is done. The poet guy leaves and heads back up the mountain, towards the spot where we came from. I honestly don't care at this point, and I just turn to the girl. What do you suppose we do? She's still overlooking the town from this path. She says, It's like you can watch the whole world, and I don't even know that they're being watched. The tone in her voice really creeped me out, and her voice was deeper sounding than what I remembered, but again, she hardly spoke at all. I say, Maybe we should follow him back up the mountain. And she turned her head in the weirdest way I've ever seen. She says, if that's what will make you feel safe. I'm seriously starting to get creeped out, and I just decide to deck it up the mountain without her approval. I'm on all fours, scaling up this mountain path. I don't know why I felt the urge to rush out of there so fast, but there was this almost instinctive thought that told me that I was in danger. I run up to a point where I feel like I'm hanging off the side, I look down for a moment, and I see the top of the girl's head, and suddenly, she jolts her head back, and she screams at me. I swear it looked like she had some pointed teeth or fangs or something. I'm nearly pissing myself at this point. I'm just trying to scale over to another ledge. I'm able to pull myself up with the help of a fallen tree limb. I look over the ledge that I climbed up for a second to catch my breath, and I don't see her anymore. I yell the poet's name, and I don't hear a reply. I look down at the tree that helped me escape. It also had an axe. I think, oh, screw this. So I start running up the thing as fast as I can until I reach to a flat patch in the forest where I can just run. I see this clearing between the trees. I walk this path until I hit a dead end. I look down and notice the five foot dirt path. I overshot it a bit when I was panicked, but whatever, I'll just climb down. I pull out my rope and I find a tree to tie down and scale down. As I'm about to scale down, a hand covers my mouth from behind and pulls me back behind a tree. It's the poet guy. He's all cut up. There's marks all over him. He's covered in blood and dirt and everything else. I probably looked a little beat up too, but he looked like he got screwed up. He had a black eye and everything. He put his finger over his mouth and pointed down. I turned around to look down the path again. The girl was there, without a mark on her. She stood on the path, completely still, for about two minutes. Then, she screamed again. It was ungodly. Then she began to, like, I don't know, shake or move weird for 30 seconds before she turned still. She turned to face the woods again. I'll meet you boys back at home. And then she walked out into the clearing and down the trail. We waited for about five minutes before heading down and out. 
we made it back to the cemetery around seven, and the mower was there. I'm glad you took my advice and brought a friend. The poet and I had headed back to the house, and the girl wasn't there. We decided to check her room, and it looked like that nobody had lived there. It's like that somebody just never unpacked or just didn't have any possessions. The part that bothered us was that he said that she had lived here when he got here, and she was always kind of disappearing and going out late. So we kind of wonder if she did this to other people. The poet just up and left town the next day. I only stayed in Ohio for a month or so. I eventually asked my friend who owned the house about the residence for that week, and she told me that the poet and I were the only people staying that she knew about. I don't fully understand what happened in the forest or in that house or who she was or anything, but for the rest of my time there, the rest of that month, I just couldn't do anything without feeling like I was being watched the whole time. So, what'd you think of those stories? Let me know which one was your favorite one down in the comments. Do you have any of your own stories? I have an email in the description below that you can send them to if you want to. I also have a PayPal and a Patreon if that's something that you're into as well. And also, once again, thank you to everybody for 15,000 subscribers. It's definitely been quite the time, and hopefully I'll be here until I reach 100 or 150,000. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Anyways, I will see you in the next video. Thank you for pulling up a stump, and thank you for 15,000 subscribers. It means a lot to me.